But then I heard what I didn't want to hear, which was that I had to go back. And I begged not to. I was with love. I mean, why? Not like I had a hard life, but I didn't want to leave. I've been able to partner with Mind Valley to present you guys free master classes between 60 and 90 minutes covering mind, body, soul, relationships, and conscious entrepreneurship. Taught by spiritual masters, yogis, spiritual thought leaders, and best selling authors. Just head over to nextlevelsoul.com forward slash free. I'd like to welcome to the show, Kimberly Clark Sharp. How are you doing, Kimberly? Hi, Alex. How are you? I'm doing very good. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I'm excited to talk to you about your experiences uh, and talk about uh, your book, After the Light. And, uh, you know, you've, you've lived a very boring life. Uh, not much has yeah. happened. Uh, I don't have much life. to share. <laughs> not much to share I'll, at I'll all. I'll read you, you know, my list of chores today, what I'm washing <laughs> in the laundry. So we're here to talk about uh, your your very very impactful uh, spiritual experience, which is your near death experience. Um, but the first question I always love asking is, what was your life like prior to having this event? Were you, you know, meditating in the Himalayas? Uh, what what were you doing spiritually, if anything, prior? Uh, that would be a big nothing. <laughs> um, prior to that, I was a college student in Manhattan, Kansas at Kansas State University. And uh, it was like living in um, an isolated part of the United States because it was. But even for the news, uh, it, it was just uh, a very conservative uh, state to grow up in. And um, I was raised Lutheran, but mainly by parents that dropped my siblings and I off at the Sunday school door as they went out for coffee. You know, the Midwestern Lutheran. <laughs> drill. Yeah, First, there will be coffee. <laughs> obviously. Jesus and had then coffee. Jello. Jesus had coffee, obviously. Yes. So, uh, no, I had no exposure to anything like this, but also no one else did either. The time was 1970 and in Kansas. So um, news of a near-death experience had not reached anyone's ears. It hadn't been coined uh, or documented that I'm aware of. Yeah, and I think Raymond Moody, I think it was a couple years later, kind of coined the term near-death experience. And they yeah, started this slowly yeah. coming, or whenever that book came out, around that time, I think. No, no, it, you're right. It was around... 76 or so something like that yeah um yeah but it hadn't happened yet right exactly so it was yeah i mean in the 70s you could near death experience wasn't even in the zeitgeist by any stretch of the imagination many of the guests that i've had on before who've had near death experiences say that they just didn't even know what it was because no one was talking about anything like this they were like they went years decades sometimes before they ran across the term near death experience like oh maybe that's what i had and and found it, and we'll talk about um, the work you're doing in Seattle uh, with your organization and, and helping others with near death experiences later in the conversation. But so, you weren't meditating in the Himalayas. You were not. Uh, <laughs> you were not uh, following Buddha steps. Uh, so what 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 happened during your your near death experience? Explain it to us. Um, I need to preface it with my dad's account of what happened because I was busy being dead. So I have no memory of what happened that day. <clears throat> um, I had a vague, I, actually, that's not true. I have a vague memory of my dad responding to my request for a chair at the Department of Motor Vehicles in Shawnee Mission, Kansas, responding with there aren't any chairs or something like that. I That's a memory I have, but nothing else. So I'll start with my dad. Uh, because that's the physical end of it. I was walking out of the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I was walking out of the DMV. And as I stepped out, I collapsed. And my dad tried to catch me, but 
dead weight is heavier than a live weight. So he broke my fall, but couldn't stop me from hitting the ground. There happened to be a uniformed nurse passing by. She ran over, determined that um, I didn't have a pulse. I didn't seem to be breathing. Now, 1970, this predates barely the whole 911 emergency response system. So at that time, two phone calls were made by somebody, one to um, St. Luke's Medical Center in Kansas City, Missouri, which was actually the closest ER to my body, big ER. And um, and then the Shawnee Mission Department of Volunteer Firefighters, and they arrived first. Again, according to my dad, um, they didn't think I was breathing either. They had a new portable ventilator. My dad said they had to remove the packaging. They put it on my face, turned it on. And this particular portable ventilator had two features. One was to ventilate, which is what you want, but another to vacuum because sometimes people get objects caught in their throat and they can't breathe, which sets up the drama of almost dying. Um, that's why we say to our kids, you know, don't run with candy in your mouth. Or in fact, if this happens while eating, it's actually called a cafe coronary. <laughs> well, anyway, I didn't have any objects in my throat, but when they turned on the machine, um, it was on vacuum mode. So whatever oxygen was left in my body um, was, I had the life sucked out of me, Alex. Literally. I mean, Literally. Yeah. It's a, uh, more than a metaphor for me. So they apparently immediately knew it was wrong. Flicked the switch air entered my body, but I guess my lungs had come in partial contact with themselves. Our lungs are sticky suckers and they do suck to it, their own tissues. So, um, the blast of air that came into my body could not be accommodated apparently by my lungs. So the air found its way ultimately to my skin, which is called epidural emphysema and really hard to recover. And I was inflated like a really bad balloon, a flesh balloon. I was just full of air. They turned to my dad and said, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do. At that point, a man came out of what I guess now is a crowd and um, just moved everyone out of the way, plucked the firefighters off me and started what we now call citizen CPR. He did mouth to mouth and chest compressions. And I'm gonna interrupt myself right now to say, one does not have to do mouth to mouth anymore. If you see someone collapse who isn't breathing, you just you know, put your hand a little below uh, where in a woman that the breasts would be and press to the tune of staying alive. And that's all. That's, that's so, which alive, is so ironic. Ah, boom, ah, boom, ah, boom, ah. Boom. <laughs> that's it. Okay. So, um, and then he gave up and apparently he was a swearing man. So had some choice things to say, but then my dad's memory ends, picks up again when ambulance arrived, a uh, cheer in the audience, which I'm calling an audience because, again, I have no memory of that, but it was a crowd. And I was breathing on my own, but unconscious. Uh, my body was thrown into, the, not thrown, it was placed carefully, I'm sure, in the back of the ambulance. <clears throat> my dad jumped in. Off we went to the hospital. Something went haywire in the emergency room. But um, I hate to give away the ending of a good book, but she lived. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So, for so all that, I still managed to live. By the way, I pulled my medical records when I wrote After the Light because I didn't want a journalist reading what I hadn't. And it was pretty interesting. You can't chart like that anymore, but it was my admitting notes were, um, you know, cause of collapse, question mark, simple faint, question mark, cardiac, question mark. The problem was the snafu with the ventilator. And I read that and thought, I'm a snafu. A snafu <laughs> My life with the is reduced venom. to a snafu. <laughs> so that's what killed me. Death by snafu. It happens. Um, about an hour and a half passed from the time we stepped out of the DMV to the ER. And I want to clarify that I had air during that time because that's not sustainable. 
um, I'm guessing that the air that was inflating me was just seeping back in, keeping my brain going. Um, anyway, that's the physical side of things. Now what I remember is a woman's voice to my left saying, I'm not getting a pulse, I'm not getting a pulse. And I turned to her and said, not noting that I couldn't see her, but I said something to the effect of, of course you're getting a pulse. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking. I thought I was being patient. Uh, she was ignoring me. So did I get into what, like a near-death snit or something? But at some point, I let go. And that's key in a way that I don't understand, but it was key. I found myself, without traveling anywhere, um, in an environment surrounded by warm fog. It was wonderful. I knew I wasn't alone. I just couldn't see through the fog to figure out who else was there. I also felt very comfortable and very calm and anticipatory, again, in a calm way, like uh, my metaphor. And everything's a metaphor, by the way, Alex. But mm -hmm. my metaphor is it's like I was at the gate at the airport, boarding pass in hand, just waiting for my row to be called. It was that kind of a feeling. And then my row was called <laughs> big time because what I call God showed up. Um, and when I say God, I don't mean that in any religious sense at all. I It's just three little letters in a big word, but I say my creator, I, I don't know. But we have a consensual agreement that God means the supreme being, the creator, whatever. Source. So I'm going to say God, but without a gender or a face or anything, it was in the form of a light that, um, well, I've never stared at a million suns. I've never stared at one sun, but it was like a million suns. It was so indescribably bright and it exploded underneath me. What I perceived as me, I had eyeballs, something I have not settled on yet. How could I see? without eyeballs uh, I I but it happens um it blew away all the foggy material and it was made of nothing but love just again in an immeasurable way and and in an ineffable way and that's one of the problems with the near-death experience the ineffability which means there are no words and there really aren't um but nonetheless, I'm going to use words. This light went out in all directions. I could turn and see and somehow understood that I was looking at linear time and it was eternal. It's like I was beholding eternity. I figure that. And then at the same time, this light was doubling endlessly back on itself. And I somehow understood that to be dimensions. Now, for a girl from Kansas, this is pretty highfalutin stuff. Mm -hmm. What? was I thinking, but yet it all was so, like I said, anticipated and calm. And I was so loved and it was personal. I got to ask questions. I didn't use words like I am now, but yet communication was perfect. And it was in the form of math and music. And when skeptics say, oh, near-death experiencers just get what they're expecting. It's like, uh-uh, I can't add, subtract, multiply or divide to this day. And I can't listen to my voice. I can't sing. I mean, in church, I was asked to lip sync. I mean, it's that bad. So here I am, yet communicating perfectly with God. Um, I asked more than I can really remember, but I do remember asking, you know, why are we born? Something to that effect. And the response was, um, you know, you, you wanted it. <laughs> you wanted to be born, so you're born. Again, it sounds so simplistic, but I, I understood it at the time. As I recall, I asked about pain and suffering. There's a good question. Again, where was I getting all these questions from? It, it wouldn't be me normally to ask stuff like this. But it was, you know, again, basically it's our way back to God. It's, you know, prayer or whatever. I don't know. Um, but then I heard what I didn't want to hear, which was that I had to go back. And I begged not to. I was with love. I mean, why 
not like I had a hard life, but I didn't want to leave. But I was sent back. And then Alex, of all things, at the DMV, I had actually had to renew a driver's license and get an, an automobile license because I wanted to buy a car. And um, I flunked, though, the parallel parking part of it. I couldn't get closer to the curb than three feet, six feet, maybe, I mean, a distance. So I'm sent back and I miss my body by the same amount of space that I recalled missing the curb, just what I felt moments before. And uh, after such a profound spiritual experience, all I could think of to say was, I can't even park myself. I mean, it was like so self-critical right from the get-go. Okay, I'm back and I'm going to criticize myself. I wasn't scared, but I could see through something, I'm guessing legs, a man I didn't recognize bent over me. And the moment his lips touched mine, I went back through him and into my body. And as I was going through him, I knew everything about the guy, at least emotionally, um, that he was actually scared, feeling somewhat of an idiot, and um, loved me. And it was a form of love that we call compassion, which is a very strong form of love anyway. Mm -hmm. So I figured this guy was like a magnet, kind of like my lighthouse of love, so to speak. If I'd just been with the greatest love of all, I would gravitate towards it anywhere. And due to this day. So um, I was back and hating it. I was fully conscious, but in my body. Again, I could see, but it was dark and cold and damp and icky. My admitting body temperature in the ER was 86 degrees, which is wonderful for a summer day or a swimming pool temperature, but not so great for our bodies. Mm -hmm. It was cold. So I beg God to take me back. And um, I had said in the presence of this light from the get-go, I said the words homey home, which I learned from my parents later is what I used to say when I was learning language. And I don't remember saying that, but I did apparently go homey home, homey home. And, well, that's what I said in the presence of this love and light. So what I said when begging and whining to go back was I wanted to go back to homey home. That was, that was where I really wanted to be. And again, Alex, I didn't have a hard life. I mean, I was loved. I was, well, you know, getting an education. I felt safe and secure. But I can whine and I can even wear down God because I was that kind of a whiner. So please take me back. So then, and I'm going to paraphrase God right now, but it was basically, all right, all right you insist. And this window opened to my right or portal or something. And there was my heaven. And again, to skeptics, what I saw looked like a Kentucky calendar photo. And I've never been to Kentucky, but apparently Kentucky is my heaven, or at least at that time, because it was uh, just endless, long waving grass and off in the distance, a white sort of fence and small growing shrubs or trees. I don't know but the grass wasn't green. It was green and the sky wasn't blue. It was blue. I mean, everything was just electrifyingly alive, not only in hues and colors, but I could perceive consciousness in that grass. And I loved it and I wanted to go. And I was told that if I went through that, that was my border. You know, I wouldn't be coming back. So I, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. Like, okay. But then uh, off to my side, there was a flash of light, which caught my attention. And I was told if I chose to live, um, I would be living in this place. And no map, of course. But it was, all I remembered was where mountains met water. It meant nothing to me. It wasn't Kansas. Then, um I ignored it. And then another flash of light as I'm about to go through to my heaven. And um, it was like a gallery of people. And I was told that if I chose to live, they would be significant in my life. But they were strangers. What did I care? So um, off I go to Kentucky. And then there was another light. And I saw myself being of service. And I said, cool. 
well, who knew God was a hippie? When I said cool, I meant it as an adjective. God took it as a verb and as an affirmative and an agreement that I would go back. And I was back. I had to recover because my body took a hit. But again, I lived and I went off to pursue that where mountains met water. And after many wonderful adventures and the ultimate God road trip, I swear, uh, I wound up in Seattle, Washington, where indeed mountains met water, everything fit. And by the way, since landing here, all those many years ago, it was 1970 still, I've never applied for a job. I've been asked to apply for everything I've ever done in this life to earn money. And um, it's not that there isn't work within those doors, but uh, when I was sent back to serve, which is what I call it, I wasn't sent without any tools. I have had guidance uh, often visible to me, uh, especially in the past, um, all kinds of visibilities. Life changed completely, but I stepped into trust and I've never looked back. I've had a wonderful life. That is amazing, amazing story. When you say that you see, you're seeing beings, you're seeing, what are you seeing? Ooh, here goes an hour of this interview. <laughs> Keep it down yeah. to, you know, 59 minutes if you can. <laughs> okay. Uh, I call them invisibilities because um, I don't want to hem any invisibility in, but I think most people would say, uh, deceased loved ones or deceased people in general, um, what we call angels, what we call demons, but I call that negative energy because it's beyond the D-E-M-O-N word. I mean, again, these are little words with big meanings. Um, guides, uh, all orbs. Oh my gosh, I've got this orb collection you wouldn't believe. But it's so but those are all distractions. I am still a Kansas person at heart. And I believe firmly in knowing one's zip code, <laughs> um, you know, eating healthily, paying taxes. I married a great guy, Seattle firefighter, paramedic, you know, have family, have neighbors. I'm the block watch captain. So I've I've managed for the most part to balance an electrifying spiritual life where I see things and just being a good neighbor and a good social worker. I'm a social worker by trade, still have a license in the state of Washington to practice social work and um, got my MSW at the University of Washington, stuck in clinical academics, became a clinical associate professor. You have to be grounded to do that because that means, you know, you have to write for grant money, got to do research, you know, sure, all sure. that stuff that academia presents itself. And I, I couldn't have done that if I were unbalanced in the spiritual realm. It just wouldn't happen. So, me. so in, in, I've heard so many near death experiences on the show. Uh, you didn't have any life review. You didn't have any council of elders. You didn't have any spirit guides, nothing like that other than the light. I went right to, I skipped over everything, went right to the source of everything was this light. Um, and there's nothing in my life, including, you know, a good marriage, um, being a mom that's come close though to the outright ecstasy, I guess I felt in that light. Mm -hmm. So uh, no, I didn't have a life review. And I'm wondering about that. You know, in the interim, I've become an expert myself. And kids don't seem to have life reviews. I've talked to one adult who has a seven-year-old almost drowned who had a life review that mainly involved gum and grandma and grandpa. But right. for the most part, we have to, to have a life review. We've got to put some time some miles in. Got some miles in. you got to put some miles in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, How old were you when this happened again? I was, I was 22 in three days. So I right, said so 22 years old. Naturally, knock off a decade, I swear. I, again, I was in a bubble. Right, of course. Yeah, you weren't a worldly uh, soul at that point. I, no. No, just you answer can, straight answer, no. Absolutely say no. So after the experience, when you come back, um, 
obviously you've changed. There isn't one near-death experience I've heard of that the person doesn't come back irrevocably changed. They are a completely different human being uh, when they come back. And that's sometimes very difficult for the people around them, family, friends, colleagues. How did the people around you and how, deal with it? And how did you deal with it psychologically, especially at such a young age too? You weren't battle hardened by any stretch. Like you said, you were in a bubble. So you were kind of thrown into the deep end of the pool here. I was. Um, and I, in terms of how, I, I'd like to say something about changing in general before I talk about myself. Sure. Um, because I've learned over the decades that people, yes, everyone changes, but it's like a continuum. So back in the days, the early days of research into what we call near-death experiences, it was thought that everyone became saints. So it went from sinner to saint, big quantum leap. And this, these are the people that are going to save the world because now they're all saints. Hallelujah. Eh, eh. What we do is just move on a little bit. We're a little bit better. So um, uh, drama can happen, but for the most part, it's uh, just continuing to live one's life and adapt. But that adaption is nuts. Oh, my gosh. So my metaphor for that was that it was like my life had been a completed jigsaw puzzle. Everything looked great. There was my future in Kansas. I hated change so much. I knew a little boy from the seventh grade, Bob Clark. I was going to marry Bob Clark. And that way, I wouldn't even have to change the monograms on the towels. I'd still be Kim Clark. So for me, change was the big measurement that I got the heck out of Dodge, almost literally. Um, and it was dramatic. It was, I'm going to call it one of those dramatic changes rather than the inching along because I did buy a car. And uh, how my family reacted was um, uh, with tears, a lot of crying, because I was going to leave. And the idea of leaving home, I mean, I swear my mother laid down in the driveway. She was a speed bump. I rolled over to get out. But the, but you told her the reason why you were leaving? No, was because, I had no, no words. No. You, so so the, the, nobody knew. They just knew you were different. Yeah. Very. Um but I was given still some words eventually. So my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, uh, when I was out of the hospital, pulled me on his wonderful lap and comforted me. And all I could do was cry, but I was trying to get out the words. And he knew something had happened. So it began with crying, which in my experience is similar to other people I've interviewed right after an NDE, as we call it. Mm -hmm. And uh, And then I had an Aunt Sophie on my way to Seattle who announced that, oh, honey, you've had yourself a spiritual experience. And, and then I remember crossing a bridge one day, and it just occurred to me, oh, wait, a bridge, and all the metaphors that a bridge comes. And, oh, I had been, in, I had a, a metaphysical experience. It, so as I, as I got older and got more exposed to things, I did find words. But for my family, it was never um, a topic that was comfortable for me to bring up. For my dad, it was emotional trauma. I was his oldest uh, by by a number of years. And uh, if I asked him questions, I learned to not do that while driving on a highway because he just began to cry so hard. It was unrecoverable what he went through to see me in that state. Uh, in time, my family became born again Christians, which meant that I was in trouble. Uh, spiritually. So they pray for me because they love me. And I pray for them because I love them. But we're on different pages about what's going to happen when we die. Um, so that reaction is something we just sort of step around. And in terms of colleagues and friends, I've got the biggest mouth in town. I just tell everybody. So, um, but what changed me actually uh, was a shoe on a ledge I found at work one day. And uh, that's when it, that shoe was observed by someone who was being resuscitated in a different part of the hospital. And finding that shoe changed, I just changed everything. Um, for one, I knew that that jigsaw 
puzzle where everything was in place, when I had a near-death experience, all of the pieces went up into the air and kind of stayed there until I found this shoe <laughs> so remote to where that woman's body was. And uh, I realized there were two of us. I, I suddenly, those puzzle pieces fell into place uh, enough that I could work the pieces and get on with my true life's work, which is supporting and validating people who've had a near-death experience it began with that one patient. So can, you, so can you talk to me a little bit about the work you're doing at the Seattle International Associations of Near-Death Studies? You were one of the first organizations to be studying near-death, right? Well, the International Association for Near-Death Studies, acronym IANDS, I-A-N-D-S dot org, is for me the center of the universe on the subject. And yes, that's where the research is. I came along um, oh, a year, year and a half after the organization was founded by uh, five researchers, four of them physicians, no, three of them physicians. Um, but no one was dealing with the near-death experiencers themselves. I mean, these were people who were in great need. And by the way, were abused sometimes uh, psychiatrically or religiously. Mm -hmm. Back in those days, it, there was a lot of trauma. Again, I'm a social worker. So social workers, I love social work. You see a need and you fill it. And there's needs everywhere. So a social worker, no one's going to get rich, but you're never going to not have a job. So um, it became my job to, like I said, to validate uh, how Seattle Ions got started was um, just four people on a couch. We were all near-death experiencers, and we shared and decided we'd call ourselves Seattle Ions. And that was 40 years ago, June 2022. So for 40 years, I've been um, in clinical support of people who've had a near-death experience, and now people who've had similar experiences, but not close to death. Uh, and of course, that also involves grief. So that's the population of the people that come to a Seattle Ions meeting. And um, it's what I call limp in and leap out. It's, because it's all there. All the help is there. It's really interesting because, you know, people hear about these near-death experiences, but a lot of people don't talk about the psychological um the psychological part of it, of just dealing with this event in their lives. Some come back completely cool. They know where they're going. It all makes sense to them. But but a lot of people don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it, I'm not I haven't, sure about that. I haven't heard too many of those stories, but generally some, some handle it better than others. That we can say. Yes. Um, but there is a psychological issue. And then also like I, like that question I asked you before about people around you, how do you deal with loss of your family, loss of good friends, loss of spouse or, um, you know, brother or sister, um, siblings, all that kind of stuff. It, it, it's a pretty deep well of stuff that comes up, that, that comes up after one of these, not to mention you died. Um, a, a, a pretty traumatic as as list yeah. of things to be a traumatic up there. It's public speaking and then death. <laughs> yeah, and then you yes, <laughs> exactly, uh, exactly. And um, I was going to say here I am live broadcast. What was I going to say? Tell me, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 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 I was thinking about changes. Yeah. Uh, not to pick on lawyers. And my dad was a lawyer. I I I love lawyers, but two of my cases in Seattle. Um, this is, again, while I was at Harborview Medical Center, where I cut my teeth. Um, uh, two of my patients who had a near-death experience were lawyers. They didn't know each other. It was different, many different years apart. But um, I remember them because they changed. Each did change to the point where they wanted to still be a lawyer, but do pro bono. One fellow um, from his bed, he was still on the coronary care unit talking to me about how he's going to sell his house and 
his practice and he was going to move to, you know, the roughest part of downtown Seattle and serve the poor and the bums and all that. And um, his family had a different opinion. You know, his wife was used to the country club life. Kids were used to private schools. He was going to like dump all that without thinking about the effect on them so that he could go serve the poor. So I did talk him into waiting a year. And that's what I tell everyone. After any trauma, don't make any changes for one year because things have to settle down emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, financially, everything elite. So the end of his story is that he managed to do it both. He kept the house and the private school and the country club existence for his wife, but did tons of pro bono work for others and is still in practice. He's way past retirement age, so he doesn't have to support his family financially. Kids are all grown, and he's committed to serving the poor. And then um, uh, the other lawyer, very similar experience. He was going to dump it all. and uh, so. But then at the other end of the spectrum, I could sit and fill your head with all the people I have talked to. It's amazing. But anyway, uh, for a while, I had uh, my boys at a penitentiary outside of Seattle where I used to go once a month and meet with felons so dangerous they were never going to get out of prison, ever. They were lifers. And to be with me required lots of hurdles, including no touching within three feet. Uh, but these were guys who, and they were all men, in this particular penitentiary uh, who had had a spiritual experience. But the guy named John that I met, I'll never forget because John came into the room and again, that three foot distance and there's two armed guards in the room at all times with me anyway. And he, but he reached out his, his arm and hand like pantomime and says, glad to meet you. My name's John, bank robber. You know, and John was born 150 years too late. He really want, he should have been robbing stagecoaches. And he was that kind of a vibe. Uh, but he had a near-death experience in the course of robbing a bank at gunpoint. And he shot and killed somebody. And even though he didn't really mean to, he had the gun and he was robbing the bank and he got caught. And then he got shot in the process. He had a near-death experience. And in his near-death experience, his mother came to him and held him like he was a little boy. This had been a guy who had lost his mom, never knew his dad, lost his mom at an early age and had grown up in the system and really was a hardened criminal because of that. The love that he cherished was from his mom who indeed loved him and to be held by her changed him completely. He'll never get out of prison. I have goosebumps talking about him. He'll never get out of prison, but he is an utterly changed. He's one of those dramatically changed people where he, he studies the Bible. He studies spiritual writings. He's just not the same guy that decided one morning to get a gun and go rob a bank and shoot somebody. Wow. Now, did you, after your near-death experience, did you were you intrigued to start to study more spirituality, more going down different philosophies or, you know, not religions, but just more spiritual concepts, ideas to try to make sense of all of this? Because again, you didn't have any real reference point other than the dropping you off on Sunday while someone else, while your parents had coffee kind of scenario. So you were, you didn't have, you weren't armed to, you weren't prepared for no. this kind of stuff. So did you do any more of that after? Not really. <laughs> I just accepted the fact that, Oh, there's some dead people, you know, good on you. Oh, there's a ghost. Go to the light. There's something very scary. Get out. Um, I was making it up as I went along. Mm. But I did have a tool, and that was called uh, my license to practice social work. Because of that, I self-diagnosed myself as schizophrenic. I don't share this that often, but I, I did. I thought I was a highly functioning schizophrenic. Wow. Because I had no other way really to explain the visions I was having. 
and uh, and there were some doozies. Oh, and then once ah, I to go up to uh, the second floor where I practiced uh, medical social work on coronary care and intensive care, I went through the emergency room every day, every morning. So I'm walking in, and there was someone who looked a lot like me and looking miserable on a gurney in two point restraints, which are wrists. And I just said something to the resident about, yeah, what's her deal? And he just as casually said, oh, she feels like she's been going in and out of her body. So we're setting her up to five. Well, the fifth floor was psychiatric lockup. I had been going in and out of my body. I wasn't going to tell anybody. That sealed my lips, I thought, forever. Okay, Kim, you are crazy, but you're not going to tell anyone. Just mind your own business. <laughs> put one foot in front of the other. Ignore all of the things you're seeing. But Alex, I couldn't ignore them. Can I tell you a story? Please. Now they're really popping in. Um, are they so there now? Are you? Are they in the room with you now? Always. Always. Oh, they're always with. Got you. Got you. So, go ahead. It's, tell me your story. It's a, a crowd, and I got to be honest. I get stage fright, so you know, I pray before we met that I say what you know God wants me to say and and that I I you're doing great I mean you know I I I'm not polished I'm too much in the trenches still to rise above it I so I you're not media you're not media trained as they say <laughs> I've which is what the media but I I don't I'm not that's not my my goal my goal though is to help people and this is a great way to help people so I love it Great. Anyway, my story. So there he was on the intensive care unit, which um, didn't have separate rooms. Curtains went around the bed as opposed to coronary care, big rooms. A woman died. She was a single parent and her 16 year old son was in the waiting room. And I had to go out with a doctor to tell a kid that the only person in his life was oh, now dead. God. And Nobody wanted to go. It was like I was there because the doctor did not want to deliver that news without the social worker. And I was there because I didn't want the doctor to deliver the news without the social worker. So, <laughs> so then um, so we, we told him the sad news and uh, I, he wanted to say goodbye to his mom, but he didn't want to see her body. And I said, I can take care of that. So I went in, and just in case he changed his mind, the nurses cleaned her up. Um, but we pulled the curtain around her bed, and then I brought him in and said, your mom's head is right here on the other side of this fabric curtain. Anything you want to tell her, tell her now. This is your chance. She can hear you because, and to this day, to the best of our knowledge, hearing is the last sense to go. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not aware of any study that has said otherwise. So I told him that. I said, she can hear you, I promise. And I walked away. But Alex, the reason I could really promise is that I could see her. And as I walked away, I turned around and he was had his head against the, the fabric of the curtain, but she was standing. I could see through her, but she was standing next to him with her arm around him, comforting him. And I knew he was going to be okay. I have uh. not seen that so vividly before or since but a mother's love can break down a lot of barriers and she was this side of physical she was so fully present for him and um i'd like to believe he knew it you feel it whether you know it or not you can feel it yeah yeah that's that's it's it's remarkable. I mean, it, what you've been doing over these years. I mean, you did come back on a mission to help as many people as humanly possible. Again, I was sent back to serve, and you have been doing that. I mean, social work. I haven't stopped. I haven't let up. I. But you know what? Though I've also had a lot of life challenges. I mean, um, I have survived breast cancer. I have uh, survived. Um, teen points of danger. It's ridiculous. The original title of the book I wrote was The Woman Who Would Not Die. But William and Morrow and Company in New York City bought the bought the rights to the book and changed the title because the sales department, and it's the sales department that determines titles, by the way, in a 
publishing house world. Um, they thought it sounded too much like, you know, Susan Hayward in the 1950s, the woman who would not die or some kind of, you know, really? movie Halloween type of thing. But I, um, I really, I have been in a lot of danger. I've had a lot of suffering, a lot of loss, but, and a lot of physical pain due to um, just bone problems. I've, just in the last two years have been really laid back, but it's okay because I know at my age that whatever I'm going through can be repurposed to help other people. And that doesn't change anything. It just, so it's like people, if I can go through this and come out on the other side, you can, because I'm like kind of a wimp. <laughs> I mean, that oh, whiny I, I, stuff hasn't changed. I mean, I, I I disagree with you. You're definitely not a wimp with what you've gone through in life and after life and back into life. I think you've you're you're stronger than you give yourself credit for. Um, I always love asking this question. I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Are you afraid of dying anymore? No, not even no. a little bit. No, um, but to be honest, and I'm usually not this honest, so. Lucky you, Alex. I appreciate that. Um, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. I'm not afraid of it, but I do not want to die. I beg for a long and healthy life because I love life so much. I can't stand it. I want to squeeze every little ounce out of this glory that we call breathing, that we call walking, that we call hugging, that we call eating that we call vacations. <laughs> I mean, life itself is such a precious miracle and it really is short. And the closer we get to the end, it seems like those revolutions on the record are faster and faster and faster. But I want to see and do everything before I check out. So I had a lot of hugging to do. But at the end of it, am I afraid? No. No. And I also know what's waiting for me. I mean, that helps. Yeah, you know the ending of the story. <laughs> I mean, I've been to Paris. And if I go back to Paris, I'll know how to get around Paris because I know it really exists and that it's beautiful and I'll know how to do it. So my afterlife would be like Paris. I know how to do that. It's Kentucky. Remember, it's Kentucky. Kentucky. Yeah. I, <laughs> there will be some questions about that. Why? Kentucky? Can we make it Paris? Can we, can I, can, can I have we a, switch? <laughs> can we switch it up, please? I'd like a ticket to Paris forever. See, See, please. With the croissants. I appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> and some exactly. Because <laughs> as we established at the beginning, Jesus loves coffee. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, um, what is the, what is the biggest lesson that you, you took away from your near-death experience? The biggest. You think I've been asked enough, but you framed it in a different way than I'm used to. <sighs> okay, this is a tough one for me right now, but it probably is pulling on that unconditional love that I was given. Mm -hmm. It's tough right now because there's things, uh, not to date this interview, but there's things going on in the world that are happening because of bad guys, what I call mm -hmm. bad guys, and I don't want to love them. I want to hate them, but I, I can't. I know that God loves everybody. Level playing field. God loves everybody. So my biggest lesson is still ongoing and that is to really and truly love everybody unconditionally. But at the same time, there's a lesson in there as well for me anyway, and that is uh, to set boundaries because I lead with my heart and uh, there are people that have needs that might interrupt my peace. <laughs> <laughs> and well-being <laughs> so i've got to also set those boundaries you know i was on netflix last year yeah i saw uh, it yeah, surviving death yeah episode one it was a good show anyway i am still hearing from people in piles because of that show because i was the one shown helping people 
I'd had a near-death experience and I wrote a book that's out there. None of that was mentioned. It was me helping people. And there are a lot of people that need help. So I still hear from them. And it's frustrating because um, I can't be everywhere at once. And I also have to back to that balance, you know, pay my bills and all that stuff. So the lessons for me continue. It's like love and boundaries, love and boundaries. Um, the loving part is probably, though, the biggest takeaway. Uh, the other thing I that is still a lesson that I'm learning is to not be nervous about sharing some things and there are times when the voice outside of me it's not even in my head goes you know do it I'm going no (laughs) yes no yes no um and those are times when I'm going to really look goofy and my ego gets involved and says you're going to look goofy don't do it one of those times by the way was uh three years ago in Chicago and there was a fellow it was in a church service, and there was a fellow that, to me, was the only person in the congregation. I just went so laser beam on this guy and knew that he was in grief and for some reason knew it was his cat. It was ridiculous. So that was one of those times when the voice said, go, and I went, no. It's a total stranger. It was a young man. Um, uh, I didn't want to, but it's like, you're going. And so I went up and said, this is going to sound really dumb, but uh, I feel like you're really sad. Did you have a cat? And he pulled out this laminated photo of his kitty at age 22, who had died. He also was 22, this cat, and he had gone through life together until two weeks earlier. And I was stunned because there was the cat. And then those invisibilities I mentioned, pat me on the head and go, good girl. Like, all right. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to ask you a few questions, ask all my guests. What is your definition of a good life? Love. Uh, the ability to uh, love others. I'm so glad I've been given that. Not everybody has that gift for reasons uh, to do with trauma or chemical makeup, biochemical makeup. So I'm very grateful that I get to know what love feels like to give, but also to receive. And that feels good. So um, that's what I like the most. But I also like pizza and I like traveling. I don't mind throwing my husband and kids in there too. I I like them. (laughs) My neighbors, (laughs) our house. You know, I just... Uh, you're you're enjoying yourself and that's okay you am you I'm you can see it at a party that you know people go oh let's go with her because i can find something funny in most situations because life's a hoot it can be a hoot there's no question about it uh next question is how do you define god <laughs> and that's it those are my <laughs> words <laughs> Uh, love, back to love. I mean, God presented God's self. Again, no religious intention whatsoever. But I was presented with love. And I did say homey home. And so uh, I would have to go with that. Love and light. Why a bright light? I don't know. Um, Didn't ask that question. But yeah, it gets back to love again. Okay. And yeah. the ultimate. Well, I'm going to add, uh, it's a hippie dippy kind of answer, but I thought about that hippie word. I became a hippie before I got to Seattle. Uh, every step on my way, I was changing rapidly. So by the time I got to San Francisco, I was a hippie and the hippie community got me this again, this girl from Kansas I loved it. I loved the drugs. I loved the music. I loved the free form of physical expression, shall we say. I loved it all. But ironically, I lived on a street named Haight because I was in Haight Ashbury. I actually had a place on Haight Street itself. And I thought, how odd. I'm so filled with love and I live in a street called Haight. 
You know, just those kinds of observations that were like, oh, isn't this interesting? <laughs> so it's back to me finding a way to laugh. And your last question, um, what is the ultimate purpose of life? I call it breathing. You know, I, people have asked me a lot, you know, so how do I find my purpose? <laughs> and it's just draw a breath and breathe it out. Everything else falls into place. But one's first purpose should be breathing, followed by being nice to everybody. We haven't spent a lot of time on the life review, but that's really good advice I just gave your listeners Mm. because life reviews happen eventually. And I want a good one. So I want to be nice to everybody, again, with those boundaries. And I want everyone to be nice because... Uh, there is a payoff, but the payoff should happen before death. The payoff should be, the re- the reward of being nice should be unto itself. Just be nice. And where can people find out more about you, the work that you're doing, and where can they get your book, After the Light? Oh, well, After the Light, um, you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, Kindle. Um, I've been approached just within the last few days about doing an audible uh the book was on tape with another book house but um it's out of print and i own the rights now so maybe that but i'm also at my direct email address oh bite me because somebody might contact me Mm -hmm. (laughs) you're welcome to it's up to you it's up to you okay well here i am so it's at k-i-m my name kim n-d-e for near-death experience at aol.com don't judge me i'm the last person in america <laughs> to have america online i am the dinosaur oh my I god it. i mean i, I listen it. i still have a CompuServe one if that makes any help you it helps oh, you feel any a better little better <laughs> no, i'm joking i don't i'm just trying to make you feel better oh, thank but you. i'm old enough to re- remember my CompuServe and my mind was a mind spring or mind something or other mind yeah you remember the other one right the other the thing yeah, is my whole like ear, ear, oh yeah, yeah. 2600 bond i'm of that era and i never left i'm, I'm still there so <laughs> kim indy e at aol.com also um seattle ions i-a-n-d-s dot org is mm-hmm. our website and the mother load for me is ions.org kim it has been a hoot talking to you it has been so pleasurable and, and thank you so for so, so much for being so uh, raw and honest with your experience and uh, thank you so much for all the amazing work you're doing for the world and um for the people that you help so thank you again my dear <laughs>